the Freeman ticket. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Kevin Friedman. I'm a sports medicine orthopedic surgeon with Rothman Orthopedics, uh, and I specialize in uh, knee and shoulder injuries. And we're going to talk tonight about shoulder pain. Uh, your rotator cuff could be the issue. So just to give you an overview of what we're going to discuss tonight, we're going to go a little bit around the world uh, of the shoulder. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, a little bit of shoulder anatomy, just so you understand uh, what we're talking about and are familiar with it. We're going to talk primarily about rotator cuff issues, including treatment, non-surgical and surgical. But then we're also at the end going to talk somewhat about other sources of shoulder pain, uh, which also uh, may be uh, your problem if you're tuning in tonight and are concerned because you have shoulder pain. So, you know, what are the most common shoulder injuries that I see and sources of pain. Again, rotator cuff disease is probably the most common, which includes both impingement or bursitis and rotator cuff tears. Uh, but then also we see things like labral tears, uh, frozen shoulder, calcific tendonitis, and shoulder arthritis. And we're going to go through a little bit of all of this, although we're really going to focus on rotator cuff disease tonight. So when we think about shoulder anatomy, and I'm going to take everybody back to biology class uh, for just a few minutes, just so you can think about uh, the shoulder. Um, the first thing is on top is what I like to refer to as the beach muscles. So that's your pec major, your deltoid, the big muscles that help power the shoulder. Um, and, they, and they sit over top of the rotator cuff that we're going to discuss. But then underneath, sits the rotator cuff. And the rotator cuff are muscles that provide rotation of the shoulder. So this is the front of the shoulder. And first there's what's called the subscapularis, which is a rotator cuff tendon in the front. And then the biceps tendon, which isn't part of the rotator cuff, goes right through the front of the shoulder. The muscle is down lower, but the tendon goes right through the shoulder. And that's why it can commonly be associated uh, with shoulder problems and shoulder pain, particularly around the rotator cuff. And then over the top and back of the shoulder are the three other muscles of the rotator cuff, what's called the supraspinatus, which is the muscle and tendon on the top, and then the infraspinatus and teres minor, which are further around the back. And the most common rotator cuff tendon to be injured is the supraspinatus on top. Then underneath that, just so you, again, understand a little bit of the anatomy are the ligaments and what's called the labrum, which is the cartilage ring. So the ligaments attached to that cartilage uh, uh, ring, uh, the labrum, and can also uh, be injured uh, along with other problems with the shoulder. And then this is just, again, showing this cartilage ring that uh, surrounds the socket. And then finally, there's the articular cartilage, which is the lining of the shoulder joint. And that includes both the humeral head and the socket. And they're what's affected in arthritis, which we'll go through at the end, um, which uh, also can be a source of shoulder pain. And the shoulder is just a very complex set of motions to be able to reach up overhead. It includes the scapula, it includes the clavicle, and it includes what we call the glenohumeral joint, which is the shoulder joint itself. And as you can see, having all these muscles to be able to power the shoulder is what creates that motion. And so there's a lot of things that can go wrong in this. So what can go wrong when we think about that shoulder motion? Uh, first, there's the muscles and muscles themselves can get strained. Uh, there's the tendons, which is the attachment of the muscle to the bone. And in particular, the rotator cuff is the most important tendon about the shoulder, although there's others. And again, that's what can be affected in a rotator cuff tear. There's the ligaments, which stabilize the bones and also includes the labrum because that's where the ligaments attach. But then sometimes those ligaments can also just get inflamed and constricted, and that's what causes a frozen shoulder. Then there's the cartilage, which lines the joint, and that's what's affected in arthritis. And of course, there's the bones. And we're not going to talk about fractures tonight, but I see a lot of shoulder fractures that can include the clavicle, the humerus, or the socket. So all those things can be affected as well. So how do shoulder injuries occur? Well, there's trauma, including falls or a traction injury, 
uh, with your arm uh, down at the side. Uh, there's also heavy lifting, but then really the most common thing I see is repetitive overuse, either overhead uh, or through throwing or just, just lifting or everyday use can cause degeneration. So patients are commonly coming in and thinking, how did I hurt my shoulder? You know, was it trauma? Did they either do something through lifting or a fall? Is it overuse from uh, just repetitive actions? Degeneration, just wear and tear over time. And then finally, there's what we call idiopathic, which means it's unknown. And there are certain things that we see in the shoulder that we just don't have a, a commonly known cause, but we still know that they happen in certain situations. And then when I'm seeing somebody, you know, I'm thinking about the history of their symptoms. I'm asking them when they come into the office, did they have a specific injury? Because certain types of problems have very specific causes. Where is their shoulder pain? And I'll show in a minute that I think about where somebody's shoulder pain is and what might be causing it. What activities make it better or worse? Do they have associated symptoms like weakness? Do they have stiffness? And do they have numbness or tingling, which typically isn't from a shoulder problem itself, but is more from the nerves, either the nerves coming from the neck or somewhere else uh, around the shoulder. As I mentioned, the location of pain is very important. So if you're listening to this and, and you have pain, you know, where your pain is can give you a lot of information about what the problem is. So if the pain's on top of the shoulder or superior, many times it's either that what's called the AC joint or the, the labrum on the top of the shoulder. If it's in the front of the shoulder, uh, it can be the uh, uh, biceps tendon or the, the subscapularis. Um, if it's on the lateral side of the shoulder, that's most common with the rotator cuff. So people who have, who have shoulder pain and they kind of cuff the side of the shoulder, that's most commonly the rotator cuff and it kind of comes down the arm. And then finally, if it's in the back of the shoulder, uh, many times that's from arthritis uh, within the shoulder joint or possibly even a, 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 a tear of the labrum in the back of the shoulder. And then everyone who comes to see me gets a physical examination. And I'm not going to go through the physical exam and, and how I figure out what's wrong with someone, but... There's palpation, I, I uh, feel for the areas of tenderness or any deformity, range of motion, uh, which includes uh, uh, reaching up overhead as well as the rotation, uh, strength to test uh, the rotator cuff and the other muscles around the shoulder. And then finally, there are special tests, which are tests that we use to test everything from the rotator cuff to the labrum to the stability of the shoulder. And these can just point us towards particular areas of damage when we're doing an examination. And then there's imaging. Um, there's x-rays, which look at the bone structure, can show us arthritis or any deformities, obviously any fracture and, uh, and x-rays on top. And then on the bottom is an MRI, which shows not only the bones, but also does show the soft tissue structure, including the tendons uh, and the muscles and ligaments. And that's why many times we're getting an MRI to get a better look, uh, a more detailed look at the soft tissue structures. So when it comes to the rotator cuff in, in particular, there's again, four muscles and tendons, and this is an extremely common source of shoulder pain. And when I think of rotator cuff problems, it's really a spectrum of disease. There's something we call impingement, which I'll go over in a minute, which is an inflammation around the tendon or the bursa around the tendon. And then there's partial thickness tears where some of the fibers of the tendon are torn, but a lot of it's intact. And then there's full thickness rotator cuff tear. So it really is, a, is an entire spectrum of rotator cuff problems. So impingement syndrome is kind of a grab bag term that we use to describe inflammation around the bursa or the rotator cuff itself, which can get inflamed and cause tendonitis. Typically, this causes pain with overhead activity, including either sports or work. It's associated with repetitive use. Uh, and many times, patients can complain of pain at night, either sleeping on that shoulder, or sometimes it even wakes them up from, from sleep. And then there's a rotator cuff tear. Now, sometimes that's a traumatic event, either from heavy lifting, or as I mentioned before, traction, or a fall directly on the shoulder and causes immediate pain. And... Patients 
I uh, sometimes can't lift their arm at all. So I just saw someone yesterday fell on the shoulder and he can't lift his arm. And I'm certainly concerned that he has a significant rotator cuff tear. But it's actually more common for me to see patients who come in with rotator cuff tears who just have degeneration over time. They don't have an inciting injury, but have the development of pain and develop either worsening pain or weakness. Uh, the symptoms of a rotator cuff tear include pain with overhead activity, uh, pain at night, as I mentioned, and or weakness on exam or a functional deficit. So how do I tell the difference between tendinitis and a tear? And I'll tell you, it can be difficult. So on history, again, there's traumatic injury, which makes me concerned about a tear or pain at night that wakes someone up from sleep. I do get more concerned about a possible tear. And then when I examine them, if, if someone has significant weakness, when I test the rotator cuff muscles, this is a demonstration of something we call the empty can sign. That makes me more concerned about a possible tear. And then obviously an MRI really helps confirm this and will show the tendon uh, uh, integrity for sure. When do we order x-rays when someone comes into the office? The answer is always, okay? Because there can sometimes be a fracture we wouldn't identify. We have someone with significant arthritis. And sometimes patients come to see me and they say, I know it's not my bones, it's my soft tissue. Why would I need an x-ray? And the reason is that I need to get an x-ray to prove it's normal to know that I can focus on the soft tissues uh, around the area. And it's actually very important to rule out diseases. So even when I get a normal x-ray and, and the, the patient says to me, well, I see, I told you it was going to be normal. That gives me a lot of information. So it's helpful. So who gets an MRI when they come to see me? Well, Again, if, it, if somebody has weakness, if somebody had a significant trauma, or if I treat someone conservatively, and we're going to talk about the conservative treatment for rotator cuff problems, and they have persistent pain, then I want to get an MRI to really see if they have a tear or something that needs to be treated more aggressively. Um, so again, what do I use an MRI for? Sometimes it's for diagnosis, but most of the time, is for preoperative planning. I tell patients I use it as a pre-surgical tool. So I don't need an MRI to make a treatment plan for a lot of people, but sometimes I use it for planning. So if somebody has a small tear, it can be treated very differently than somebody who has a massive tear where their whole head is uncovered. So this can tell me something about the prognosis for treatment or how I might want to treat it with surgery. So what are the goals of conservative treatment, particularly for tendonitis? It's to control inflammation. It's to do a rehab program for rotator cuff and strengthening and the scapular stabilizes the muscles around the shoulder blade. It's to work on stretching of the shoulder muscles, particularly the posterior capsule, which can prevent people from rotating behind their back. And, you know, how long do we do this? Well, we used to make everybody do it for a real long period of time before we got more aggressive, things like nine months, then sometimes it was six months and three months. But what I can tell you is that the overwhelming majority of patients who I see who don't have a rotator cuff tear, but have just inflammation, impingement, or tendonitis, I can get better with conservative care. Um, so again, what do we do to control inflammation? It includes rest avoidance of overhead activities, some gentle range of motion to prevent stiffness, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications like either Motrin, Aleve, or a prescription non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication. Then there's physical therapy. Uh, this is probably the most important thing to try to treat rotator cuff problems. Um, what are we doing? We're trying to strengthen those humeral rotators, including the supraspinatus. We're working on the mechanics of the shoulder blade. We're stretching out uh, those uh, muscles, tendons, and the capsule, the, the ligaments, and even core strengthening really help because it helps position the shoulder in the right way um, to try to prevent inflammation. Um, for those who tuned in and really uh, all they want is to try to get some type of home therapy program, I'm not going to go through therapy exercises tonight, but I will make this recommendation. This is a very good uh, start for a home conditioning program um, from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. It's available on their website. All you have to do is Google this AOS rotator cuff and shoulder conditioning. It'll come right up. 
Um, and it's a, it's a good place to start if you have shoulder pain and you're just looking for somewhere to go. And it's also a very good preventative program. So if someone's tuned in and they're just worried that they don't want to have something happen and injure the rotator cuff, this is a good place to start as well. Uh, but I will say that there really is significant value in formal physical therapy. Um, injections is something we use a lot around the rotator cuff, and this is for people who either fail therapy or come in with significant pain. Um, a cortisone injection is really designed to help calm the inflammation. I tell patients it's like putting 100 Advil right in the area of the rotator cuff to calm down that inflammation. And again, it's always an adjunct to therapy. So I don't want someone to come in, say, doc, give me a quick fix, give me an injection, and then they get better from the injection, but they're going to come back eventually if they don't do that therapy to improve the mechanics. So it's really important to do both. Now, finally, I threw this in um, about biologic injections because my gut is there's going to be some questions about this. Um, so PRP is a, um, is a blood product where we take somebody's blood, we spin it down into the what's called platelet-rich plasma, and it has a bunch of growth factors that can be that can be used to calm down inflammation and possibly to to heal tissue. Um, so this can be used uh, around the rotator cuff. And when you look at the, whether or not this works for rotator cuff, particularly tendonitis. Uh, the data is really mixed. There's some studies that show that it provides some benefit in inflammation, but then typically over the course of time, that's not even any better than cortisone. There's other uh, studies that have looked at this. PRP is a control without much difference in function. So honestly, the data is really mixed. So I, I don't generally end up recommending this, but if I have a patient who really wants to try a PRP injection, you can. Um, I'm going to talk about surgery in a few minutes, but just since we're talking about PRP and I can do it now, when you look at surgical augmentation using uh, PRP with rotator cuff repair, there is some data that says that it may minimize or, or, or lower the risk of re-injury or re-tears. So there is some data that it can help in that setting, but again, it's mixed uh, and uh, uh, sometimes the data is all over the map. So who do I send for conservative treatment when you come in with a rotator cuff problem? Nearly everyone, um, anyone with rotator cuff tendonitis or bursitis goes for conservative treatment, including physical therapy, possible injection, anti-inflammatories. Anyone who has a large tear or a chronic tear, I send to therapy to try to regain the balance in their shoulder. And it's not someone who we certainly want to rush to surgery. So almost everybody with uh, tendonitis gets better with conservative treatment. So that's really an important concept. And then finally, this other thing on the bottom to know is that there are patients with full thickness rotator cuff tears that improve with conservative treatment, never go on to surgery. So when somebody comes in and they say, I have a tear, why would you try to treat me conservatively? There's some good data that says that we can try and treat a lot of people conservatively and in, in many settings they can do well. So it really depends on some of the particulars of the situation, but just because you have a tear doesn't mean you need an operation. So when do I do surgery? What do I think about in terms of decisions for rotator cuff surgery? It includes somebody's age and activity level, how long they've had symptoms, uh, chronicity of the tear. So if somebody has an acute tear, I'm much more likely to want to fix it than if somebody has a chronic tear that I want to try and treat conservatively and see how they do. What kind of quality of tissue, and that sometimes can do with patient age and other factors. And then also what somebody's expectations uh, for, their, for their outcome. So acute full thickness tears, I nearly always do treat with surgery. A chronic tear that doesn't do well with conservative treatment and then if somebody has persistent impingement or tendonitis that fails conservative treatment, we'll occasionally do surgery. But again, this is rare. And in the subset of several hundred shoulder arthroscopies I do a year, it's very rare that I'm doing it on someone who doesn't have a more significant tear. When I do go to surgery to fix it, it's almost always done arthroscopically. These are small little pencil-sized poke holes. We use a camera and a TV screen. This is outpatient surgery. 
And we've really advanced how we do this. So we used to do something called a single row repair where we just tacked it in one spot. And we now almost always, and at least in my hands, always do a, what's called a double row repair, which, in, which improves the strength of the repair and can improve healing and, and uh, really prevent re-injury. So this is just a, 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 a sample showing a hole in the rotator cuff. And this is the type of sewing of what's called a double row repair. So it's kind of tacked in two positions. And it looks a little bit like a, a, a macrame there. And I'm going to show just a quick sample of what it's like to do a double row rotator cuff repair. So this is arthroscopy. We're looking at this through a camera. That's a hole in the rotator cuff. This is also showing that I did an acromioplasty, making space for the rotator cuff. This is now putting it in anchor. So we use little rivets that have sutures attached to them. And this is the way that most people uh, fix it. So those sutures then have to get tied through the tendon. That's the whole purpose of the operation. This is using a little spear to try to get the sutures, to try to bring them through the tendon. And there's a variety of techniques to do this, to get the suture through the tendon. Once they're all placed through the tendon, they then can be tied down. And that's the first row of repairing the rotator cuff in a what's called a double row repair. So this is using a knot pusher to, to tie knots uh, arthroscopically so that all those sutures are tied. And then after they're tied, we're then going to place another set of anchors on the further side of what's called the tuberosity, which is where the rotator cuff's attached. And this then tacks it down in a second spot to increase the security and increase what we call the footprint, which means a much larger area of the tendon is attached to the bone. So that's just showing the rotator cuff attaches is another example of a double row rotator cuff repair where the tendons tacked in two spots. So that's uh, how we do rotator uh, cuff repair. Generally takes about an hour for me to do. I joke when we show the video, it takes me about a minute and a half as you see, but really about an hour of outpatient surgery. Um, I tell all my patients, my job's easy because I do several rotator cuff repairs a week. Um, what's it like for them? Well, for the first six weeks, we're really protecting this repair. You're in a sling for about four weeks. Um, depending on the size of the tear, depends on when I start someone in physical therapy. If someone has a small tear, I will start them initially with passive range of motion pretty much right away. But if somebody has a big tear, we keep them in their sling for the first four to six weeks and don't start any physical therapy. Then after that, we begin working on getting them the full range of motion, start some strengthening with what we call active assist. So you help it uh, up, but then start to do active motion. But really for the first three months, we're still providing some protection. Then after that, we really start more active strengthening and try and get people more functional. And it really takes you know between four and six months to make people uh, fully functional and back to work, back to sports and everything they like to do. When you look at strength, it's really greatest in the first six months and up to 90% of the non-operative side. It's been shown that it can improve all the way up to a year after rotator cuff repair. And overall, when you look at success rate, it's about 90% successful for arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. Now we've discussed rotator cuff disease. And again, I'll let you ask some questions once we get through, but I wanna just touch on these other sources of shoulder pain. Um, so you have some background and it could be affecting anyone in the, uh, in the audience who's having shoulder pain. So what about the labral tear? So the anatomy of the labrum, again, it's the cartilage ring that surrounds the socket. It provides stability and the attachment of the ligaments. And people can tear the anterior labrum in the front, the posterior labrum in the back, or the superior, which is the labrum on the top. So what uh, do people feel when they have a labral tear? It can be some type of uh, catching or pain inside the shoulder, uh, pain with certain activities, either overhead or instability is certainly the most common thing to occur from significant labral tears, especially in our younger patients. And as I mentioned, the most common would either be an anterior tear, which is also called a bank art tear or superior slap tear, which we can see in throwers and then posterior labral tears, which can either occur from degeneration and arthritis or sometimes in uh, uh, instability towards the back of the shoulder. 
Um, anterior labral tears, again, really occur most commonly from a dislocation or subluxation. And that's usually with a fall on the, the arm uh, in the abducted externally rotated position, which is up like this. And this is just what it's like for somebody with shoulder instability, where the shoulder slides out of socket with an anterior labral tear. Again, this is most common in our younger patients. And then this is what we see arthroscopically. This is another shoulder arthroscopy. This is inside the joint. And this is a somebody who dislocated their shoulder. The labrum on top is torn off. And then in addition, uh, the labrum in the, in the front, as well as the back is torn. That's the ball of the ball and socket joint. This patient's on their side in what's called the lateral decubitus position. And this is torn labrum. That cartilage ring is torn completely off of the bone. So how do we treat labral tears? Initially, we typically treat it with rehab and many patients can improve with a non-operative treatment program. But for those who either fail that or have significant instability or persistent pain, we do an arthroscopic labral repair where we again tie that tissue back down to the bone, similar to what we did with the rotator cuff, but little different uh, tools, uh, but it's the same principle. Adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder. I think many people uh, hear about a frozen shoulder and a lot of times people come in and they're, they're concerned. They don't want to develop a frozen shoulder with a shoulder injury. So that's when the connective tissue that surrounds the shoulder gets inflamed and it responds by tightening and scarring down. Um, typically patients complain of stiffness and pain. Um, if it's before a shoulder freezes, sometimes people just have pain, but once it does freeze, their, their stiffness is the most uh, uh, significant thing that people complain of. Um, what causes it? Many times it's unknown. So this is one of those things that's what we call idiopathic. People just develop a frozen shoulder without any inciting trauma. There are certain medical conditions such as diabetes or thyroid disease that can predispose towards this. And sometimes when somebody's immobilized after injury, if they stay like that too long, that inflammation can lead to a frozen shoulder. How do we treat it? Physical therapy for stretching is really the most important things. Uh, I do use cortisone injections for this many times inside the joint itself to calm down the inflammation. And surgery is uncommon and really used as a last resort for a frozen shoulder. Calcific tendonitis, this is a specific type of tendonitis where calcium deposits form around the rotator cuff tendon. This can be the most severe shoulder pain I see. If somebody comes in with absolute severe shoulder pain without a history of trauma, can't move their arm, the number one thing that I'm thinking of is that this is calcific tendonitis. Um, these uh, deposits can uh, resorb and the pain can resolve over time. But for that initial phase, we really need to try and help provide some symptomatic treatment. Um, most of the time, we don't know what causes this. Um, the way we treat this, again, is a cortisone injection, which can really help calm down the inflammation and pain, as well as, of course, a physical therapy. Um, we do do ultrasound guided aspiration, which many of my partners will do if a deposit is persistent. And occasionally I do arthroscopic surgery to remove a calcium deposit, but again, that's not as common. And then finally, we'll talk about shoulder arthritis. So there's osteoarthritis or wear and tear. Sometimes this is post-traumatic if somebody's either had prior injury or surgery. And there's really two, two major types in the shoulder. There's what's called the AC joint, which is the joint on top of the shoulder. That's very common. People can have bone spurs or prominence on top of the shoulder, and that pain's directly on top of the shoulder. And then there's glenohumeral arthritis or the ball and socket joint itself. Now, finally, there is rheumatoid arthritis, which is an inflammatory type of arthritis. Most people who have rheumatoid arthritis know it. They have multiple joints involved. It can attack the connective tissue that surrounds the joint and causes inflammation and, and pain. And typically x-rays look a little different in somebody who has rheumatoid arthritis than osteoarthritis, which is more common. Again, AC joint arthritis can cause pain with motion. It's directly on top of the shoulder, usually wear and tear, repeated overhead activity, weight lifters, very commonly get arthritis in this joint. Um, it can be diagnosed by physical exam and x-ray. It hurts when people come across their chest, typically causes pain right on top of the shoulder and it's tender to touch. 
This is treated conservatively almost always with injections and physical therapy. And occasionally I do surgery to remove the end of the clavicle bone to prevent that joint from pinching on top. Um, so that's an arthroscopic surgery to treat AC joint arthritis. Then finally, there's glenohumeral or shoulder joint arthritis. This is less common than other uh, joints in the body. We see people with weight-bearing arthritis in their hip and knees, but we do see it in the shoulder as well. Um, the bone-on-bone -bone contact leads to development of bone spurs and pain. Um, sometimes people can have weakness of the rotator cuff muscles uh, surrounding it that's associated with this arthritis, and this causes pain and loss of motion. Um, it can have both mechanical or medical causes, but most commonly it's, it's from wear and tear. What do we do to treat arthritis in the shoulder? Uh, conservative treatment, including uh, ice and heat and modalities, physical therapy to work on range of motion and strengthening, medications such as anti-inflammatories, activity modification because repeated use weightlifting can really aggravate symptoms, and we do, again, use cortisone injections. Uh, these are typically given inside the shoulder joint if somebody has arthritis. And things like PRP that I mentioned before can be very effective for osteoarthritis of the shoulder and can be given inside the joint. If somebody leads to surgery for uh, uh, arthritis, that ends up being a shoulder replacement. Now, when it comes to total shoulder replacement, which we do do, that's for advanced shoulder arthritis, not relieved by other uh, options as that I just mentioned. It's basically replacing the ball and socket with metal and plastic components. Uh, and it can hopefully restore pain-free movement and requires a rotator cuff to move the shoulder. So this is for people who have intact rotator cuffs, uh, but shoulder arthritis. Now, many people also have heard of a reverse shoulder replacement. Now, this is different. This is for somebody who doesn't have an intact or functioning rotator cuff, and they can develop something called rotator cuff arthropathy, which is that they have arthritis and rotator cuff disease. Or sometimes if somebody has a massive irreparable rotator cuff tear, we will do a reverse shoulder replacement to restore their function. This again is for pain and weakness. It's typically best for older patients, and it does have a higher complication rate than what we call anatomic shoulder replacement. So we reserve it for the right uh, indications. Again, this is just looking at what a reverse shoulder replacement, total shoulder replacement is. So the ball is now in the place where the socket used to be and the sockets where the ball used to be. And that's why we call it a reverse shoulder replacement. And this also looks at what an x-ray looks like. The one is an anatomic shoulder replacement. So it really looks like a shoulder. There's just metal and plastic in there. You can't see the plastic and the metal replaces the ball. And then the other side is what we call a reverse total shoulder where the ball is now where the socket was and the socket's where the ball was. So it does have a different look because we've completely changed the mechanics of that shoulder. So what can you do for your shoulder pain? Well, number one, I think the most important thing is to get a proper diagnosis. If you're out there and you don't know what's causing your shoulder pain, I think it's important to see someone. Um, I, obviously, I'd be glad to see anyone. We have a, a whole number of sports medicine and shoulder physicians, all of who take care of shoulder problems uh, at, at, at really uh, a lot of our offices. So someone be glad to see you and try and figure out what is causing your shoulder pain to try to get you better. Um, if you just wanna do some type of preventative program, as I mentioned, that AOS shoulder conditioning program is a really important step to try to either heal tendonitis or try and keep your rotator cuff strong. So I think that's an important step to do. Um, and, you know, I would just encourage everyone to take charge of your health and don't let your shoulder pain interfere with enjoying life because we have a lot of treatments, mostly non-surgical, but also surgical to try to help your pain. And that's all I have for you. Thank you uh, for your attention. Uh, we're going to do some uh, Q&A if there's questions. Um, if anybody, uh, you know, wants to see what, what rehab protocols are like after rotator cuff and some other things I have this uh, a QR code will um, take you uh, right to uh, uh, our, my uh, web profile. Great.
Thank you, Dr. Freeman. Actually, if you can leave the QR code up um, a little bit longer because uh, there are a bunch of questions coming in. You had a ton of great content um, and I know some of them might need that QR code. Um, so I'm gonna go through these. If there's others that need to be submitted, I'm just gonna ask that you don't keep them or that you do keep them kind of general because if you get too specific, we have a lot of people on here and we are recording it. Also a reminder, if you do need to make an appointment with Dr. Freeman, that uh, VIP line is 610-480-6584. It gives you night and weekend hours. So uh, 610-480-6584. So the first question we have is, what is the approximate amount of rotator cuff tendon retraction that precludes repair? Um, so that's a very good question. And there's no, there's no absolute answer to that. And the reason is because, as I mentioned, one of that slides that I had said, you know, decision making for surgery. And so I just mentioned a patient who I saw yesterday who fell, and I am suspicious of a massive rotator cuff tear. And that tear can retract all the way and be significantly retracted. And yet, because it just happened, I can go in arthroscopically and I can easily take that tendon and with, uh, you know, some work, repair it back down to the bone. However, there are some people who have chronic rotator cuff tears where they've been retracted for years. And if it's retracted significantly, despite attempts to try to move that tendon, you can't really get it back down to the bone. So it's not that there's a certain amount of retraction that I immediately say that can't be fixed, but it certainly can be more difficult in a chronic setting to get a tendon mobilized and back down to the bone um, than in an acute setting. Now, the other thing I'll mention is there's other things we can do. I mean, I, you know, it, it's hard for this audience for me to lecture about like every different thing we can do to repair rotator cuffs. So if I have a rotator cuff tear, that is significantly retracted. There's all kinds of things we can do. Number one, when we're doing surgery for it, sometimes you can release it to be able to get it back down to the bone. Sometimes you can do something called a partial repair, meaning you get some of it repaired, but not all of it. There's something called a superior capsular reconstruction, which is a surgery to basically replace part of the rotator cuff to provide function in someone with a massive irreparable tear that we can't otherwise normally fix, but they don't have arthritis. So there's all kinds of things that we can do. Um, so again, it really requires a, 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 a physician evaluation for assessment of what's going on to determine whether or not that rotator cuff can be fixed. It was a long answer, but I hope you understand that it's it's a great question, but it's not simple and it is individual based on a whole bunch of factors. Thank you. For a 76-year-old man with moderate glenohumeral joint arthritis, but little or no pain, are there exercises you can recommend to keep this shoulder strong? Yeah, again, that, that shoulder program that I recommended from the AOS would be something that would be great because it involves gentle stretching and has some strengthening. Um, you know, arthritis is a little bit of a different animal because you want to keep the joint as mobile as you can and strong, but you also don't want to irritate it because arthritis can't, with overuse, too much overuse can tend to get irritated. So it's got to be, a, you know, somewhat a, a, a controlled program. And certainly, you know, for anybody also who is interested in doing some therapy, I mean, again, formal therapy, I think is a, a, a incredibly valuable for almost all shoulder problems. And we have therapy at, you know, nearly every office um, in our system and is really an important part of getting a shoulder better. So I would encourage that as well. Uh, to go along with that question, what is repetitive motion that you mentioned? Repeating a motion 10 times, 20 times, 50 times, how much rest is needed for those muscles that are involved repetitively? <laughs> um, I mean, it, again, it's a little bit of a tough question because it depends on what the specific problem is. I mean, we use 
repetitive motion to mean everything from someone who is a painter and is constantly doing things overhead to someone who's doing you know repetitive motions at the side to someone who's a baseball thrower who's repetitively doing it so and there's no absolute definition so it's not like i say oh well once you do it 50 times that becomes considered repetitive motion but if somebody's having pain with certain activities that means yes we really need to try to um, decrease the amount of times that they're they're doing those things that that are potentially irritating it. Um, so I, I'm not going to give you an absolute definition, um, but definitely resting from those activities that are irritating you are going to provide some benefit. But the flip side is I don't want everybody on the call to go into a sling for a month because their shoulder is going to get stiff and then they get disused. So that's not the answer either. So it's always a balance. What proportion of patients with a torn RC fail, uh, rotator cuff fail conservative treatment and need surgery? Well, it depends on the particular problem. If you look overall at patients who come in with a small, full thickness rotator cuff tear that occurred um, without specific trauma, just sort of, you know, repetitive overuse or degeneration, um, there is a portion of them, probably around 50 to 60%, if you look at the literature, who can go through a program of physical therapy and improve and their symptoms go away. Now, some of those will come back and have a problem. And we do need to monitor them to make sure that their tear doesn't get significantly bigger or worse but it really is probably about 50, 60% when you look at the literature and there's no, for most people, and again, it depends on the type of tear, there's not a huge harm in trying that program and seeing how someone does before we say you have to get an operation. And then a lot of times people declare themselves because if you go six weeks or 12 weeks with a conservative program and don't get better, then you're not likely to get better with further conservative care. But if you do get better, then you can potentially be monitored and continue with that program. Okay. Uh, this person had a rotator tuff, uh, cuff tear recovered by physical therapy. Is there any activity she should avoid, uh, like playing racquetball sports or golf, rowing? I, you know, the goal is with whether it's with conservative treatment or surgical, is to get people back to full activity. So I wouldn't say there are activities that you have to avoid. Heavy lifting, especially heavy overhead lifting, certainly you know, is the most likely to aggravate or potentially worsen a rotator cuff injury. But no, I think that if you have gone through a rehab program successfully and aren't having pain, we like to get people back to racket sports and golf. And as long as they're not having significant discomfort doing it, there, there's no major harm in doing it as long as you're keeping those muscles strong. Okay, next question. What is the treatment or prognosis if the injury to axillary nerve as well as torn rotator cuff from falling down the stairs? They did have surgery back in 2022, but they're still, they still have weakness in the deltoid muscle. Yes. So, so, so that uh, a nerve injury. So sometimes when somebody dislocates their shoulder or falls, they can end up injuring the nerve that powers the shoulder muscle. So the axillary nerve is the nerve that powers actually your deltoid, your big muscle. So if you have a injury to that nerve, it can cause weakness. That's not just from the rotator cuff. Um, and that can be, you know, that's a rare problem, but it is a significant problem that can take a long time to get better, unfortunately. Um, you know, that, again, that's a, it, it's a tough question to answer in this type of seminar because it can require a lot of time to get better and a lot of therapy, but usually most nerves return their function over time. So typically, if there's enough time that the muscle and the nerve will return its function. Great. Uh, last question. Um, this person developed uh, calcific tendonitis twice requ requiring injections and physical therapy. Is there any way to prevent deposits? 
Well, it, calcific tendonitis doesn't have a known cause on why they form. So I get asked that question all the time by my, my patients with calcific tendonitis. Like we don't really know why they happen. Um, if somebody has a recurrent calcific deposit, I typically end up recommending the ultrasound guided aspiration because many times that will get rid of the deposit and keep it from reforming. So I think that that's, uh, you know, it, it, a, a good thing to do um, to try to prevent it from coming back. And then occasionally we do surgery to, to remove a calcific deposit and then typically it doesn't come back. Um, but there's no like medication or anything that has been shown to prevent calcific deposits. All right. And one last good question. Uh, how much mobility would I lose if I have a reverse total shoulder replacement? Well, the reason that can be hard to answer is because I don't know, you know, it depends on what your shoulder motion is to begin with and what the indication is for the surgery. So when we do a reverse shoulder replacement, um, you know, if somebody has a massive rotator cuff tear or rotator cuff arthropathy, many times they really can't lift their arm up at all. So they're sort of only getting to about here. So the goal is that maybe we can get them up to, you know, 100, anywhere between 120 and 145 degrees. That's the average. If you look at reverse total shoulders, we do have patients who have reverse shoulder replacements who can get their arm up all the way. Sometimes people end up still having some weakness with rotation. But if somebody has full range of motion and pain, and then they get a reverse shoulder replacement for that pain, there is a possibility that they actually could have less motion, which may be the question that I'm being asked, because they already had full motion, despite the fact that they don't have a functioning rotator cuff. Um, the amazing thing about the shoulder is that I have patients who come in to see me who have a small rotator cuff tear, and they can barely lift their arm for whatever reason, that shoulder is imbalanced and they can't lift their arm. But I have other patients who have a massive rotator cuff tear. Their entire head is bald. And yet if I examine them, they are fully strong. They can lift it up overhead. They can do everything. So somehow they were able to strengthen those muscles around it to the point that they don't find, feel the symptoms. So that's again, why I'm emphasizing this importance of therapy. Uh, but it also shows why sometimes somebody's function could be unpredictable based on the anatomy of what's going on there. Thanks. And if you have time for one more, somebody wants to know your opinion on stem cell therapy. So there, I mentioned PRP. So PRP again is a blood product, platelet rich plasma. There's also the only quote unquote stem cell therapy that's really available in the United States is what's called BMAC, bone marrow aspirate concentrate. And that's where there's actually cells taken out of the bone marrow, usually from the hip, and that can be injected in different areas. Um, I will tell you that in most studies, when you look at any type of pain relief, there isn't much better results with that over PRP, which is why I typically use PRP because it's easier to do and it's, and it's cheaper for patients. When it comes to healing, we really haven't figured out that technology to get it to create any specific rotator cuff healing, either non-operative or operative. So it may help people from symptomatic relief, but if somebody comes in with a full thickness rotator cuff tear and they say they saw, you know, an advertisement for whatever place it is that they're going to heal my rotator cuff with stem cells, I will really tell you that there is no good data to support that that's going to happen. Great, thank you. Um, some comments coming through, just how wonderful uh, that you've done their shoulders. So uh, great results. Um, somebody asked if the registrants are gonna get this recording. Yes, I will send it out in the next few days. Um, somebody else also wanted some ideas for PT. I would just encourage you to go on, uh, if, you, if you have your phone available to, um, get that QR code and pull up. He has a wonderful database of plans um, that you can, it's a great resource you can browse through at your convenience. So I really appreciate it. A lot of people just thanking you for taking the time to come on here and just giving 
um, them some good information. So I'll end the recording again. Um, if you need to make an appointment, 610-480-6456, sorry, 6584. <laughs> um, and thank you, Dr. Freeman, for taking the time to do this. Thank you all for joining us tonight and have a great evening. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you coming on. Take care. Yeah.